There we go. Good afternoon, folks. Welcome to this afternoon's webinar. Uh, today, we're going to have uh, basics for new beginners for in the mailing business. And our instructor today, our speaker, is going to be George Heinrich, commonly known as the Postal Professor, someone that I've had the pleasure to, to know for and work with for, for decades, since I think we both had hair, which is probably a long time ago. Uh, George uh, has, is a veteran of a couple of direct mail companies, own, the owner of, of, of those companies. Uh, and he's, uh, he's never worked for the Postal Service, but he's still recognized throughout the industry uh, as, as a postal authority and a mailing operations specialist. Uh, he's often a featured speaker at conferences and provides uh, some very valuable insights into the relationship between uh, the Postal Service and its customers. Uh, he provides training and consulting, of course, to the industry and has been around with trade associations forever. Uh, he's, uh, we're very fortunate to have George as, as one of our, our instructors, one of our uh, consultants. And, of course, he's, uh, he's uh, active in his local PCC back in the Denver area. Uh, the original MFSA uh, honored George by presenting him the Luke Kaiser Award uh, several years ago for outstanding contributions to education in the direct mail industry. So along with all of everything else he's doing, he spends a lot of time simply helping some of our, many of our subscribers uh, and, and helping them with, uh, with various mailing problems, always using his traditional good humor and his depth of, of, of postal knowledge. So without any further ado, uh, I'd like to hand it over to George uh, to, uh, to give today's presentation. Thank you, Leo. That was a really kind presentation. And, and folks, if you've never met Leo, he's an amazing guy amazing knowledge of the Postal Service, and it's an honor to work with him. And, and thank you, Leo. Uh, your check is in the mail for that wonderful introduction. Good morning, good afternoon, everybody from sunny Denver, Colorado. I hope you're having a wonderful day. It's uh, my honor today to be here to fill your brains with some postal stuff. Uh, if you notice, uh, that's my baby picture. Uh, okay, so it's not. But uh, you notice I changed the title a little bit on the uh, webinar to Commercial Mailing for Beginners, because that's really what we need to talk about today. And what I want to start with here is the difference between commercial mail and just regular mail. And commercial mail isn't an envelope with a stamp with some wonderful little hearts drawn on it and a cancellation stamp, nor is it a mailbox. This was actually mailed to Ripley's Believe It or Not, as was this roll of toilet paper, as well as this bra. So I would have loved to see the postal clerk when, the, when the, somebody walked in with this and says, I want to mail it. But they were able to mail it, and they were all received by Ripley's Believe It or Not, who was doing a, a survey on unique things that can be mailed. So if you have any ideas, let me know, I'll be happy to send it for you. Uh, what commercial mail is basically is getting a list of names and letting your data department manipulate those names. Then you have a mail piece that either you print or someone else prints. Then you address it, put a barcode on it. You sort it to meet postal regulations. Then you put it on a pallet ready to take to the post office and you take it to the post office, and then they do their magic, and somehow it ends up in a mailbox. Well, hopefully, uh, what I'm going to share with you today will help you understand a little bit about how those pieces end up in the mailbox. We've got an awful lot to cover today, and uh, you know, this is essentially an eight-hour class that's been reduced to one hour. I, in the beginning, I thought I would just use every eighth word, but I figured that wouldn't work. So I'm going to talk really fast like this if it's okay, if that's not a problem. All right, everybody raise your hand if it's okay. I, got, no, I still don't see any hands, so I better slow down. All right, so what is pre-sort? And to, to simply define what pre-sort is, is to sort the mail to get it as close to its final destination as possible before the USPS has to handle the individual pieces of mail. So the closer you get to the destination, the less handling, the lower the cost. You know, if you get it to a single zip code, that's the lowest rates. If you have to do a majority of sorting by the Postal Service, that's the highest rates. That's basically how the rate system works. And that's why when you go and look up rates, there are different levels. 
based on the sortation of the mail. Okay, so let's talk about mail in general. When we're talking about mail, we have basically one business partner to use, and that's the U.S. Postal Service. And they are quite a behemoth. They're quite large. To put it in perspective, they process 47% of the world's mail. That's about a half a billion pieces of mail a day. That is a phenomenal number, a half a billion. They deliver to over 158 million addresses, most of those six days a week. They have 31,000 post offices serving 42,000 individual zip codes. And there are about 37 million address changes annually. When we get later in the program, you're gonna learn about address changes and move update. You can imagine 37 million a year, okay? There are a bunch of rules and regulations that you've gotta follow, and they are all in the domestic mail manual. Uh, if you have the printed version, as I do, uh, it's 1,862 pages of printed material, two-sided. Uh, it weighs six and a half pounds. I used to take it with me as an example. Uh, however, since the airlines are now charging for uh, excess weight on baggage, I've stopped doing that and I use it as a doorstop. It works very well as a doorstop. It's also online at pe.usps.com. So if you are in the mailing business and you are responsible for understanding postal regulations, this should be a favorite on your computer because you will reference it frequently. Some other things about the USPS. Well, well number one is you gotta learn how to speak postal. There are 600, come on, there we go, 665 unique acronyms. I'm not gonna go through them, I was considering that, but I figured we wouldn't have time today, nor tomorrow or Wednesday to go through, or, or Thursday to go through all of these. So I'm gonna skip over them, but understand if you're new to the mailing industry, there are acronyms and you need to, that you're gonna hear, there's probably a dozen on a regular basis and you need to understand what they mean and what they do, okay? So let's talk about the difference between retail and discounted mail. Essentially, discounted mail is commercial mail. Retail mail is, the, is usually hand addressed, has a stamp on it, you put it in a blue box, or you take it to a post office, or you give it to a letter carrier, but somehow you put it in the system. One of the things I highly recommend is do not put outbound mail in your curbside mailbox with a flag up. That flag is a signal for potential mail theft, especially if you're sending a check or anything like that. Make sure you put it in some kind of secure environment, not in your mailbox with your flag up. Now, on this retail mail, the Postal Service does all the work. They do the barcoding, they do the sorting, they do the transportation, and of course, they do the delivery. But because they do all the work, they call this, raw, excuse me, raw mail. Got choked up on that one. All right, so let's talk about how we earn postage discounts. All right, number one, you want pieces compatible with automated equipment. Postal Service uses machines to sort mail, okay? You want accurate addressing, and accurate addressing is actually a two-part process. The first part is checking the address to see if it's deliverable, and the second part is to see if that person still lives at that address. Is good old Charlie still at 123 Main Street? He might be one of those 37 million people who put in a change of address. Then you wanna add the barcode. And you not only barcode the pieces, you barcode the trays or sacks, depending on what you're using on that job, and the pallets. We'll talk a little bit more about that later in the program. And then you sort the mail again to get as close to its final destination as possible. That's how you earn discounts. And in some cases, if you transport the mail rather than the Postal Service transporting the mail, you can also gain some postage savings. <clears throat> so obviously there are classes of mail. We're, most of you I'm sure are familiar with all of them. Some of you with just first class and standard. So there are five basic ones. So there's, there are some that both have retail rates and commercial rates. Those are expedited services. Talk about those in a moment. First class mail, 
and package services. So again, you can pay full retail or you can pay commercial discounted rates. Now for commercial rates only, there's only two classes of mail. One is periodicals and the next one is marketing mail or as I know and love it and most of us do called standard mail. And we'll go in some detail on these in just a moment. Okay, so let's talk about first expedited services really quick. Okay, because you will come across this. If you're new to the mailing business, a lot of what you'll do will be standard, a lot of what you do will be first class, but there'll be times that you'll need to know about these expedited services. The first one is called Priority Mail Express, it used to be called Express Mail. It's basically overnight delivery. It com competes with uh, UPS and FedEx for overnight delivery. However, the one thing that is unique about Priority Mail Express, it can be delivered seven days a week, 365 days a year. You pay extra for Sunday and holidays, you do not pay extra for Saturday delivery. And it is the only class of mail with a delivery guarantee. I think that's an important thing to remember. Some people think that other classes of mail have guarantees. They do not, just Priority Mail Express. And then there's Priority Mail. This is basically two or three day delivery. It's not guaranteed, but most of the time it does get delivered within that time frame. okay? It also has flat rate envelopes and boxes. So you pay the same price, whether it's going across the street or across the country, whether it weighs one pound, or 20 pounds. And I use these all the time, as do a lot of my friends. Uh, my son does a lot of stuff on eBay. He uses priority mail all the time. <clears throat> Excuse me. Continuing on, periodicals uh, are basically magazines and newspapers and mail at a specific re frequency. You have to be authorized by the Postal Service to mail at periodical rates. It, it's a very complicated set of rules and regulations. Um, if you're not doing periodicals, I, honestly, I will recommend you to shy away from them. If you are, I sympathize, and I'll leave it at that. Package services are basically heavier parcels. They're usually large and heavy. They're not going to be letters or flat size mail. Okay. They, usually merchandise, printed matter, or some things that are not required to mail in other classes. And again, there are certain requirements on specific classes of mail, okay? And in package services, there are four unique subclasses, and each one of those has their own set of rules and regulations. And um, make sure you understand those, because honestly, they are quite confusing and you may think it fits one subclass and all of a sudden you learn it doesn't. So make sure you've done your homework if you have to deal with any kind of package services mail, okay? Then we have good old first class mail. And this was the profit center for the postal service until about 12 years ago. And that's because people have started communicating differently, obviously. And it's up to Leo to let you know about all the financial side of the Postal Service. We're just gonna talk about the rules and regulations here, okay? Certain things must mail as first class. Anything that is typewritten or handwritten. Now, this can be a problem. I've, I've actually run across this a couple of times recently where someone has used technology to make their message look handwritten or look typewritten, and there have been postal clerks who have rejected it as as being standard mail. So uh, hopefully that doesn't happen to you. I just want you to be aware of it because technology today has allowed us to to kind of replicate both typewritten and handwritten. Uh, anything that is personal correspondence from me to you. Um, if you have anything that is personally signed, I, 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 this goes back a few years, but there was a mailer who wanted to send out Christmas cards and he had about 2,500. So he wanted to do it to his customers and he wanted to do it at standard rates, uh, which he thought was a great idea. It would have saved him a lot of postage until he asked the salespeople to sign the cards. And the minute he did that, it became personal correspondence and forced that mail into first class. And this is a very gray area. So it's important to do your homework as well anytime you have personal correspondence. Bills or statements of accounts must mail first class. I call those 
money owed or money owned. That always has to mail first class. And then business reply mail obviously is first class. Okay. Uh, there is no service guarantee on first class mail. A lot of people think there is. There's not. It's going to get there when it gets there. It does get preferred handling through the Postal Service. It's handled before standard mail. It's handled before periodical mail. But there is no guarantee of service on that. Uh, there are pre-sorted rates, obviously, for first class mail. And an important thing to remember is the maximum weight for letters and flats is 13 ounces. Uh, some parcels uh, can weigh up to 16 ounces, mailing first class. So if you have a large flat, let's say, that is right very close to 13 ounces, and your client decides to add an insert to that, it's going to push it over the top and it's going to push it to priority rates. So be very, very cautious about that if you're dealing with a heavy mail piece. And all right, next is our good friend, marketing mail, also known to many of us or most of us as standard. Again, it's used for marketing purposes, hence the marketing mail name, okay? Known as many as bulk rate or the J word. Now, I don't like the J word. If you don't know what the J word, it rhymes with monk or funk or bunk. Um, we prefer not to use it but some people still do, so I have decided to class it up a little. I am spelling it J-U-N-Q-U-E, and I'm calling it Junke. So if anybody gives you a bad time about it, just call it Junke mail. <laughs> anyway, first of all, standard mail has pre-sorted rates only. There is no full rate pre-sort, or full rate uh, for standard mail. And all standard mail has to weigh less than 16 ounces. Most mail does a lot, but again, it can weigh almost a pound. So you have, in order to mail as standard, you have to have a minimum of 200 pieces or 50 pounds. So if you have any, any math people out there, the minimum number of pieces that you could ever mail standard would be 51, weighing close to a pound. Or if you had 100 of them weighing eight ounces, that would be 50 pounds. But most of the time, you're going to deal with 200 pieces or more of standard mail. There is no service guarantee on standard either. And I have what I call Heinrich's Law. It's called the Big Three. It'll get delivered in three days, three weeks, three months, or three years. We're just not exactly sure. But the most, most of it will get delivered locally three to five days and across the country in three week, within three weeks. Okay. There is a special subclass for nonprofit for nonprofits, uh, standard mail nonprofits, and I'm, we're not going to go into it. We really don't have time to cover it in this class. But what I want you to do is I want you to write this down. It's USPS Publication 417. You can go to whatever search engine you choose to use, and just type in USPS Publication 417. You will should get a, uh, a PDF of this. It's something that you can download, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> and something you can reference. It has all the rules and regulations for nonprofits, and of course there's many because there's additional postage discounts, but one of the great things about this publication is that it has examples in the back of, of things that qualify and things that don't qualify, and it's a great learning tool. So I highly recommend that you have access to that as well. All right, um, Leo, I'm going to ask now, are there any questions so far? Any yet, George. I think you're going, you're doing fine. Am I? Okay, just checking. All right, uh, we're going to go into processing categories. Okay, about 90% of all mail is processed on some type of automated equipment. Okay. And the pieces that are compatible with this equipment are called machinable. So you're going to hear that word a lot when you're dealing with mail. Machinable mail. Okay. And pieces that aren't compatible, obviously, will result in manual handling, which will increase postage, and it will also slow down delivery times. Because, again, there's manual processing involved. 
There are three basic sizes of nail based on the type of machine that process, that's processed on. First one is letters. The next one is flats, which are basically magazines, newsletters, those type of things. And the last one are parcels. We're gonna talk about letters and flats, but we're not gonna talk a lot about parcels. We really don't have time. And again, the parcel, parcel select part is quite, quite complicated, okay? Now here's what I would, something else for you to write down. There is a great video out there that the Postal Service put together that shows you how they process mail. It's called Systems at Work. So what I would recommend is use uh, whatever search engine you're, you're familiar with and type in USPS Systems at Work. And it should take you to a YouTube video. It's a nine minute video, but it is a terrific video that shows how the Postal Service processes mail. And if you've never seen that, it'll open your eyes because it's, it's quite interesting. And if you think about it, if they're processing half a billion pieces of mail a day, they've got to figure out some better ways to do it than sort it by hand, okay? So let's talk about letters. About 80% of all mail volume are letter size, okay? It's the fastest processing speed. Those machines run 36,000 pieces an hour. If you wanna do the math on that, it's 10 pieces a second. Just think about that, 10 pieces of mail moving every second. That's speedy, okay? Some rules about letter size. The pieces must be rectangular in shape. Okay. They must meet an aspect ratio between 1.3 to 2.5. So to find that aspect ratio, you take the length of the piece divided by the height of the piece, and it will it should fall between 1.3 and 2.5. It has more regulations than flats and parcels because of the speed of processing. And pieces that are not envelopes or cards have to be sealed shut to prevent jamming in the sorting equipment. You can just imagine a folded piece of mail that isn't sealed going through a machine at 10 pieces a second. It's not gonna last for very long, okay? And it's a very complex set of regulations on sealing. And, and we're not gonna go into detail on that right now. That would be a whole separate webinar. But here's a little example. This is, a, these are the specs. <clears throat> excuse me, from the Postal Service of the 33 different ways that you can seal a letter size self-mailer. So you can see it, it's quite complex and learning these, especially those in the, in the top section, the top 10, um, are gonna be critical in, in helping move the mail through your, your company, okay? Some other, letter size specs that are really important. When you're measuring length and height, the length is always parallel to the direction of the address on a letter, okay? You have a minimum size, which is three and a half inches by five inches by 9,000 thick. Now I know there's a couple people in this webinar that have some experience and they're going, oh, wait a minute, it's not 9,000. Well, if it's a postcard, it could be 7,000. But if it's larger than a postcard, it has to be 9,000 thick. Now, the maximum size, there are two different maximum sizes. For envelopes and cards, the maximum size of a letter size piece is six and an eighth by 11 and a half, okay? For a booklet or a folded self mailer, the maximum size is six by 10 and a half. Those rules changed about uh, seven years ago. They used to all be the same, okay? The maximum thickness of a letter size piece is a quarter inch, and the maximum weight of any letter size piece, no matter what the class of mail is, is three and a half ounces, okay? If you exceed any of those, you go into a different category. So here's your basic specs for your envelopes and your cards. And then there's your basic specs for your booklets and folded self mailers, okay? So that kind of is a generality on 
<coughs> excuse me, on the letters. Let's talk about flats. Now, the Postal Service many times calls flats large envelopes. So if a piece exceeds any of the maximum dimensions of a letter, it becomes a flat. If it's longer, if it's taller, if it's thicker, it'll become a flat. However, sometimes letter sized pieces can mail as flats because of address placement. We're not going to spend any time on that today, but it does happen when, <clears throat> usually, when the address is going the short dimension. And these are affectionately known, called flatters, flat letters, flatters. Okay. The minimum thickness for a flat is nine thousandths. The maximum thickness for a flat is three quarters of an inch. So that's a big range between those two. Okay. The maximum length is 15 inches. Now it's different for a flat than it is for a letter. The length is always the longest dimension. No matter where the address is, again, the length is always the longest dimension. And the maximum height is 12. So 12 by 15 is the maximum size of a flat. And again, here is a little diagram showing those to you. And there is a rule that says if you put a barcode on a flat, it can be as small as five by six. But if it doesn't have a barcode, it has to be larger than a letter. Okay. There's some other specs on flats. Flats, just like letters, must be rectangular in shape, and they have to meet both flexibility, rigidity, and uniform thickness standards. Okay. A flat has to be flexible enough to bend, yet rigid enough not to fold over on itself as they're processing it. That happens to be called the droop test. It's the one on the right. The, the uh, image there on the right is called the droop test. And no one wants their mail to be droopy. And if you want to know more about both of these tests and how to perform them, you can go to DMM section 201.4 and it will give you all the gory details. Happy reading. Okay. So there are standards as, on flats as where you can put the addresses. Okay. First of all, for envelopes or wrap flats, meaning here's a flat that is sealed on all four sides when the address is parallel to the long dimension. The address must be in the, either the left half or the right half of the flat. Okay, it cannot be in the middle where a lot of people put it. it. Has to be either in the left half or the right half of the flat. Okay, if you have a vertical envelope, there it is, vertical envelope with the address parallel to the short dimension. The address must also be in the top half of the flat as shown, and it cannot read upside down. Those two are pretty simple. Again, those are envelopes which are sealed on four sides, wrapped on four sides. The one that gets a little complicated is this next one. This is for an unwrapped flat, basically magazines, uh, newsletters, those type of things that are still flat size. You put the bound or the final folded edge on the right side, and the address must be in the top half of the flat. That is even if the bound or final folded edge is on the short dimension. It still must be on the right, and the address must be in the top half. And again, when it's in the top half, it can't read upside down. It can read long dimension, short dimension. It just cannot read upside down. So here's a couple examples. The Costco book there you see has the address on the front of the of the magazine. The bound edge is here on the right. Okay. This one from Best Friends Animal Rescue. This is on the back of the piece with the bound edge on the right. So the big rule to remember about flats that are not uh, sealed on four sides, bound or final folded edge on the right, always, okay? Talk about parcels real quick. Mail pieces that don't qualify for letters or flats are considered parcels. There are three different parcel categories based on their physical properties. 
Machinable means they run on a machine. Non-machinable, but you can guess what that means. And irregular, those are parcels that need more fiber. So any of you that are over 50 are laughing now, I know that, thank you for that. Longest dimension on a parcel is always a length. I always question a box that is 12 by 12 by 12, which one's the length? I'm not sure, I'm always confused on that, okay? The maximum weight of a parcel is 70 pounds. However, if it is a machinable parcel, the maximum weight is 35 pounds. And that's all we're gonna talk about on parcels right at the moment. All right, moving on. Leo, we got anything yet? Or just press on? Not yet. Not yet, George. Not yet, okay, just checking. All right, so let's talk about quality addressing. It's pretty important. So here is a very interesting address that I found. This is, uh, this is to someone in Iceland, and it has the country, which is nice. It has the city, which is, uh, I don't even know how to pronounce that. Buldaldalir, okay. And instead of a name, it's addressed to a horse farm with an Icelandic slash Danish couple, three kids and a lot of sheep, okay? But to help find it, they drew a map. I would venture to guess that this probably got to where it was supposed to go. And also, by the way, it also had this comment, this Danish woman works in a supermarket, and then thank you. So this would not fly with the Postal Service, no doubt. So we need to talk about how we do it with the USPS. So very simply, the address is to specify where it goes, okay? Most, and I, I say most mail, must bear a complete delivery address. that has a name of a recipient, a street number and a name or a PO box, and a city, state, and a zip. There are a few exceptions to that, but most mail has to have that, okay? Discounted mail, however, requires that the addresses be updated within 95 days prior to the mailing. That's something called move update, and we'll talk about that in a few moments, okay? Whether it's on the machine or in person, Postal Service reads the addresses from the bottom up. Start, where's it going? What city, state, or zip is it going to? Then within that zip code, where's it going? Then who's it going to? And then anything above that isn't critical to the Postal Service, okay? The endorsement line does work in certain cases and all that information must be left justified. Street names should always be spelled out and abbreviations should meet USPS guidelines. There's a publication called Pub 28 that has all the authorized USPS abbreviations. And directionals are critical to good addressing. It's very important to have good directionals. I'll show you an example. This happens to be Rexburg, Idaho. I just happened to find this. There is a West First Street North, but there's also an East First Street South. And there's, there's a South Second West, and there's a North Second East. Without the directionals, that mail's not gonna get to where it's supposed to go. So it's really important that you have good quality addressing, that you, you tell your clients, if they're providing the list, make sure we have directionals and make sure you have, we're not gonna go into it, but also make sure you have suite numbers, apartment numbers, unit numbers, those kind of things, they are important, okay? So again, the addresses must be approved within 95 days prior to mailing, it's called move update, okay? The purpose of this is to eliminate undeliverable addresses, that just makes, Common sense is perfect. There are four basic approved methods for this. The first is NCOA. This is what most mailers use. We'll talk about what it is in a moment. Then there's address change service, there's ancillary service endorsements, and then there's two alternate methods called legal restraint, 99% accurate. And they're, they only apply to first class mail. And again, that's quite complicated um, if you need help Contact us at Mailers Hub, we'll help you with that. Okay, so there's a couple steps that the data goes through to meet move update. The first one is called CAS 
Sometimes it's called CAS DPV. And it's a process where you, your customer's data is compared to a database provided by the Postal Service. And if it's, a, it's an address match, it will sign a zip plus four and it will also confirm that that is a deliverable address. If it is not a deliverable address, the record will not have a zip plus four. It will only have the five digit zip code, okay? The next step is NCOA. And NCOA is a database of all the change of address orders that have been received over the past four years. If you are an individual who's moved in the past four years and you told the Postal Service, your name and address are on that file. Okay, then you, the customer data is then compared to see if there is a move on file. And if it is, it updates the data with a new address as well as the date of the, the order was filed with the Postal Service. One thing that's important to remember is address data must have a zip plus four to process through NCOA. It's not a zip plus four, it does not process, okay? And one unique thing, one in five people never tell the Postal Service that they moved. So no matter how hard you work to clean a list, it's likely that there's gonna be some undeliverable mail out there because no one ever told the Postal Service that they were moving, okay? Then address change service simply is a program where the barcode is, has, in, is encoded to tell the Postal Service to automatically send address changes that are on file. And the changes can be sent either electronically or manually. Ancillary service endorsements are their own beast. Instructions are printed on the mail piece telling the USPS what to do with the mail. There's about six different things you can print on the piece. They're very specific. They have complicated guidelines. And each of the different regulations has different fees. And if you use the wrong one, it can be quite costly. I know of a university that used the wrong one and ended up paying over $7 a piece to get course catalogs back. So it's very important if you're using ancillary service endorsements to understand what they are, how they work, and then what the fees are related to that. Okay, let's talk about the barcodes. Well, the barcodes are the keys to how the Postal Service sorts and processes the mail. It, it, it makes all the difference to the USPS, okay? They also provide the Postal Service with management, uh, allowing them a manage, better management of, their, uh, of mail movement. So when you print the intelligent mail barcode on a mail piece, it'll identify whether the piece is a letter or a flat. It also will identify the class of mail and what services you want the Postal Service to provide. Do you just want delivery? Do you want address change service? Do you want tracking? Do you want a combination of those services? That is all encoded in the intelligent mail barcode. Then there is a field called the mailer ID that will identify either the mail owner, the mail service provider, or a third party, depending on specifically the needs of the mail owner. It also allows you to uniquely serialize an individual mail piece. So that individual mail piece can be tracked through the system. And of course, it has the delivery point information. And the delivery point essentially is your mailbox. It's 11 digit number that represents your mailbox. That's what's all in, uh, encoded in that uh, 65 bars, 31 digits. There are three different IMBs that are used for letters and flats. You have one that's on the piece. There's a good example of the one that's on the piece. Then you have an IMB that is on the tray or sack tag right here in the middle. And that links back to both the mailer ID on the piece, as well as the destination of that tray. And some of the software allows you to print some additional information down at the bottom of the tray tags. So use that to your advantage to help your production people. And then you have an IMB on the pallet flag. So when you have a finished pallet of mail, you put a flag on it and that will also identify the trays that are on that particular pallet and links back to electronic documents that we'll talk about in a few minutes, okay? They all link together. 
to help track mail and confirm the quality of the confirm the quality of the mail preparation. So the barcode on the pallet flag tells what trays are on the pallet or trays or sacks are on the pallet. And then the barcode on the tray or sacks tells what pieces are in the trays. That's how it all links back together, okay? Also, when you use the IMB on a piece, you earn a postage discount. That's called automation rates, okay? And if there is an IMPB that is used on parcels, mainly for tracking purposes. It looks like this. It is, it's a completely different format. And if you do a parcel and you don't have an IMPB on it, you're going to end up paying 20 cents more for that parcel. Okay. There are guidelines for printing the IMB, obviously. Size and spacing of the bars is important. Clearance from any other printing or label edge, both above or below on both ends, as well as reflectance of contrast. If you think about it, the barcode on the letter is read in about 1 30th of a second as that piece is moving by. So these things are really important. You want those barcodes to be readable. So the quality of the barcode is critical to helping the USPS processor mail. If you have a window envelope, the entire address and barcode must remain visible through all movement and insert. Remember, the address part of that is the street name, street number, street name, city, state, and zip not the name of the individual necessarily, nor any other information, okay? So you need the address and the barcode to remain visible. Here's an example of a piece. This particular piece, the address was completely visible. And um, they actually, someone sprayed a barcode on this brown colored envelope and they couldn't read it. So the USPS ended up putting a label on it and spraying their own barcode on it so they could process it efficiently. And it just kind of puzzled me because in, in here, I don't know how well you can see it, it says auto. Well, that means that the piece should be barcoded. So there's this thing called the tap test. And when you have a window envelope, you do the tap test. You tap it twice on the bottom and twice on each end. So you want all of your information to remain visible through that window. And that's what happened with this one until I tapped it on the top. And then you see that the barcode showed up. Well, obviously that was a mistake on whoever mailed this and they ended up paying more postage because that barcode did not show through the window. And it could have been 100,000 pieces at about two cents a piece. So that could have been quite costly to them. Okay, paying for postage. Obviously, this is important. All right, this is not gonna work. This is kind of, kind of unique. I love it. They take, what do we got? 35, 39 cents. And then they weren't sure there was enough. So they taped another nickel down here at the bottom and wrote, said, I'm not sure I put enough on it. That's not going to work for you in commercial mail. You got to pay postage in another way. There are three basic ways, stamps, meter imprints, and permit imprints, sometimes called indicias or indicias, depending on what part of the country you live in. Okay, everyone, each one has their own set of rules for discounted mail. Okay, so let's talk about meters really quick because they're not used as frequently as they used to be. First class meters must have a correct date. Standard mail must have the month and year only or no date and a proper endorsement. This is an example of a meter imprint for those of you who are new and not familiar with it that also has the endorsement. It says pre sort first class mail on it, okay? So if you're doing any kind of discounted mail, first class pre-sort or standard, you need to make sure, and using a meter, make sure you have that endorsement uh, slug in there. Stamps. Stamps that are used on discounted mail are called pre-canceled. And the reason they're called that is originally they had two black lines printed through them. Each typical, or each stamp is assigned a unique rate. Your first class stamps, you pay a quarter for, your standard stamps, you pay a dime for, and your nonprofit stamps, you pay a nickel for. The difference between the total postage and what you've paid for the stamps is paid at the time you enter the mail. And your software should take care of all that uh, for you. So you can just uh, process that mail, get it to the post office, 
and either take a check or use your uh, account. I was going to say CAPS. I forgot the name. I'm drawing a blank on the name of the new EPS, Enterprise Payment System Accounts. Yeah. All right. When you use stamps on discounted mail, the pieces must have a return address. That is absolutely a critical regulation. So make sure that you double check that if you're using stamps on pieces. The permit imprint, also known as an indicia. The postage information is basically printed on the piece. Permits can be used on all classes of mail except for periodicals. And when you use a permit, you have to have a minimum of 200 pieces or 50 pounds. Even if it's full rate first class, you still have to meet that requirement, 200 pieces or 50 pounds. So if you have a first class mail permit, looks like this, it has to have the word mail, whether it's full rate or pre-sorted. It has to say first class mail. Second line says US postage, third line says paid. Then where is the permit held? And then what is the permit number? Okay, if you're doing standard, it does not have to say pre-sort standard because all standard mail is pre-sorted. You can just use the word standard. Again, postage, paid, the permit number, and the city where the permit is held and those two can be switched or you can use what's known as a company permit okay a company permit uses the company name as it's registered with the postal service instead of the permit number and the city where it's located when you use oops let me go back real quick i'm sorry i got ahead of myself up there when you use a company permit, you also are required to use a return address. And the purpose of that is so if there's any particular problem, they know where to go back and get resolution to it. Okay. Reply mail. There are three basic, and, and again, reply mail is part of what we do. A lot of mail we get has reply pieces in there. First, there's metered reply mail. This is where the postage is prepaid by the mailer. And where, where you see this is where the mailer is pretty sure that somebody's going to return the piece. Otherwise, it's wasted postage. So it, it would just make sense. This happens to be a, a utility company. And this is the only way at one time you could pay your bill. So it's pretty sure that that piece was going to get returned or your electricity was going to get turned off. You have courtesy reply. And this is where they provide you a reply device but you have to pay the postage yourself and then there's business reply mail okay the addressee pays postage when the piece is returned postal service charges both first class postage rates as well as a handling fee a lot of rules and regulations on business reply mail and this is kind of a guideline as to what the piece has to look like and again this is all accessible in, in uh, Postal Explorer online. So if you need to know this, also if you have a, if you're familiar with a cust business customer gateway and you have a customer that needs artwork for reply mail, whether it's courtesy reply or business reply mail, <coughs> excuse me, you can, there's a, there's something on the gateway called the automated business reply mail template and they will actually create the artwork for you. Put the, the FIMS, which are these vertical lines, put these horizontal lines, barcode, it'll do that all for you. Provide you with either a PDF or an EPS file, okay? And then when you're done preparing the mail, you have to enter the mail through the back door. And that is at the BMEU, Business Mail Entry Unit. You don't take your mail to the front counter, you take it through the back entry point. And your local post office will tell you where that is. Documentation has to accompany that mail and it's presented one of two ways. It's either electronic documentation, which is preferred these days. You're talking about something the Postal Service calls eDocs, the industry. There's one of two kinds of documentation. It's a mail.data or mail.xml file that contains all the details about the mailing. Okay. Then there's hard copy. And some people are still using hard copy. Mailing statement, qualification report. 
and smaller mail mailers are using this and the postal service is still accepting these at this time okay once the mail is taken to the post office it is verified and then checked for the quality of preparation making sure you, you've done it properly and then that quality is recorded and reported on something called the mailer's scorecard okay and here's a sample of what the mailer's scorecard looks like um, what they're really monitoring are two things first is this one particular section in here uh, if you will notice on this particular scorecard which is almost three years old now uh, this particular month there were almost 4,000 pieces with duplicate barcodes on them that just should not happen because each piece is individually serialized so this identifies some kind of problem in processing whether it's a data problem whether it's a production problem there's no reason to have 3900 duplicate barcodes the other thing that they are monitoring is move update and they're checking how many pieces and then how many change of addresses you did not catch and there are some tolerances on both of these things and if you if you exceed the tolerances you're going to get assessed a postage amount and here's an example of that this is a particular mailing that ended up having 60 pallets with duplicate barcodes on them and unfortunately it was found after the fact and the mailer ended up paying a, an assessment of three thousand dollars because of those 60 pallets having duplicate barcodes they actually lost it essentially lost a discount that they had to repay back to the to the postal service all right so that's the scorecard that's a brief overview of the scorecard i think we have a scorecard class coming up soon with tom all right i think it's uh time to answer any questions that you may have leo yeah george um i had a couple uh comments here one was uh, i think we found one of our callers found the youtube um, reference you you made about the, the post services processing video, mm -hmm. um, and and we can send that out to our to our uh, callers today to make sure because otherwise they have to kind of write it down very carefully. We had one question about barcodes, asking mm -hmm. it whether if resprayed or relabel, like like if you put a limb limb over it, uh, how is it tracked back to the mailer? How, I'm, they're not they're confused about how some mailers use the wrong mid the wrong mailer ID during pre sort right right it is it is not um if you're using a limb limb if you're putting the label on the piece it's not tracked back because the postal service is reading the barcode that they put on which does not have your mailer id in it okay so you lose right. the track you lose the tracking on that one um is and that would apply that, that would apply if you're using a pre-sort bureau too unless they their documentation links back to your documentation yeah i think if they're spraying i think if they're spraying it on they're putting their mailer id on and they're linking their theirs back to yours I right know that one, one of my clients does a lot of work with a pre-sort bureau and and they are able to link what they put on the piece back to my client's mail the other thing about the mailer ID, the wrong mailer ID, this is this is really an interesting topic now. Um, I have a client in California who, looking at the scorecard last month, suddenly had 95,000 pieces of undocumented mail, which means that there was mail with their uh, mailer ID and the barcode that didn't have any supporting documentation. And we found out that that particular mail was entered in process in Baltimore. So what happened is somebody used the wrong mailer ID. And it's something that anyone who is monitoring their scorecard needs to be aware of. And they need to make sure that they can prove that it's not them. Um, you know, this would have been, if they would have been seamless, uh, it would have been quite costly for them, something to the tune of $27,000. But they're not seamless yet, thank goodness. But um, it could be something as simple as a typo, uh, swapping two numbers and, and putting a $27,000. Yeah, could have been, yeah, it could have cost them $27,000 because someone else used their mailer ID. 
Well, the one thing that, that, that I want to make sure that everybody realizes, of course, is that today's, today's webinar was, well, we're about, what, 45, 50 minutes here. And as George said at the opening, it was a condensation of a much longer course. And, and we realized that what he talked about today was, was complicated. I mean, you know, the, the DMN, his doorstop, is full of rules. So it, it's, it's going to be uh, very challenging for anyone who on a call today to understand all of this. As you can see in the screen there, uh, we offer, uh, through George and other instructors, a wide variety of training, more in-depth courses about this, about production, about uh, soup to nuts. Uh, and we would encourage anyone who wants more training via webinar or on-site to contact us. And I think that, I don't know if the, if the, if the website there is training, training at mailershub.com. And we can certainly, you know, provide you with whatever information you need because in, in today's world, mistakes are expensive and no mailing service provider can afford to make mistakes. So a little bit of investment in training is something which clearly would be a beneficial thing to do. Um, as I said, there are, there are things we can uh, train on all the way from automation, address management, resource basics, or just postal boot camp, which is the, the full version of what it did today, or anything else. Um, but we're getting close to the one hour time. We'll have things to do. I don't want to hold anybody up any longer than they have to. George, I really appreciate your, your, uh, your giving this class today. There he is at the Postal Forum. We'll be at the Postal Forum. We'll have their learning lab. George will be there. So we'll be giving more courses in the learning lab as well as all the courses that are offered by the forum itself. So we look forward to seeing uh, everyone who's on the call today at the forum. Or please call us if we can help you with anything else, answer any questions, uh, or provide any additional training for you or your staff. Uh, it's always something which we believe is important so that all the customers of the Postal Service, both the mailing service providers who do the work and the, and the folks who pay the rates, uh, get the service that they want and that they deserve. Uh, with all that in mind, I want to thank George again today for being our, our, our very valuable speaker. I want to thank Michelle for making sure all the lights come on and everything works right. And, of course, I want to thank all of you for calling in today. We'll have another webinar in about a month. We look forward to having you call in at that time. Until then, thank you again, and have a great day. Thank you, Leo. Take care, everybody.